Hello and a very warm welcome to this special edition of the France 24 debate. I'm Sanam Chantier. I come to you from Lebanon, which held its first election in almost a decade on Sunday. Now, it was Iran backed uh, Shia group Hezbollah and its allies that uh, remained somewhat victorious. And it was Hariri, the prime minister's uh, Sunni movement, the future movement, that suffered some losses. Now, the parliamentary poll itself was marred by the fact that there was a rather low voter turnout. And in fact, some people have been taking to the streets today to cry foul. However, overnight, the mood here in Beirut was rather jovial and celebratory. Here's a look back at how the events unraveled over the past 24 hours. Hezbollah supporters parade through the streets of Baalbek, their stronghold not far from the Syrian border. Preliminary election figures show the Shiite movement and its allies gaining over half the seats in Lebanon's new parliament. Results hailed by Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah. This is a great political, parliamentary and even moral victory. It represents a triumph of the resistance. It will protect the country and guarantee its sovereignty. And it has happened thanks to God by way of this election. Hezbollah's success risks complicating Lebanon's relationship with the West. The Iran-backed movement is considered a terrorist group by the U.S., the EU, and Gulf Arab states. Hezbollah has also been an ally of Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. The results weaken the position of Western-backed Prime Minister Saad Hariri, who saw his party's seats drop by around a third. The international community always wanted an election, and we had an election. And this is the results of the elections. I think uh, Lebanon, the international community, should uh, look at the results in a very positive way. Despite the losses, Hariri is likely to remain prime minister. Under Lebanon's power-sharing system, the job must go to a Sunni Muslim to ensure balance between Sunnis, Shiites and Christians, the country's three main religious factions. The election's biggest winner was abstention, with half of Lebanese voters choosing to stay home. That was Alison Sargent reporting in Paris. Now, joining me now is Marwan Hamada, a politician and journalist here in Beirut. He's currently Lebanon's Minister of Education. Thank you very much for joining us, sir. Now, I want to start with today's daily newspaper, Al-Akhbar News. There's one word on that. I want our viewers to be able to see this. And in English, it means the slap for Saad Hariri. What are your thoughts on that? Well, it's a hard word, but it translates some of the truth. In fact, the law drafted by Hezbollah and uh, by President Aoun and his associates was, uh, has been a law that encircled contained and weakened the moderate forces in Lebanon. And the result today is a strengthening not of the Hezbollah bloc by itself, but with its allies, it has now a very strong presence, something like one third of the parliament, something they ne ne never attained before. So, so what wider political implications can something like this have? Because we've got the numbers, we're throwing them out. It has a lot of implications. It is dangerous on the internal political balance of the country, which, as you know, is a country of conviviality between Christians and Muslims, and that cannot afford extremism. Hezbollah is linked to Iran, to Wilayat al-Faqih. It's a big problem internally for the balance. It's a problem... And, of course, the link to Saudi Arabia. Yes. It's a, it's a problem regionally because it puts us more in the Iranian camp and uh, widen. I want to move on to that a little bit later. For now, I want to focus on Lebanon's politics. And we know that a large number of independent candidates were actually running. They were running on this anti-corruption platform. That's what they were saying. Because I don't believe in the system that currently exists. You're part of that. You are a minister of education here in Lebanon. People are now taking to the streets as we speak. It's turning rather violent. They're saying that our votes were not listened to and there was fraud here. What do you have to say about that, minister? You know, I have a lot to say because, you know, I've been minister and an, I'm an old timer. I've been minister since 1980, 11 times. And this is the most corrupt 
regime and the most corrupt government I've been part of. And Europe continue to be a part of that, despite the fact that you refer to it as being corrupt. I resigned and boycotted many times this government during the past year. And I think we are, with the bloc to which I adhere, uh, shifting to opposition totally uh, in the next government. So we're talking about opposition, but I want to focus on those independent candidates. No, the question for you here, Minister, is that even they didn't manage to bring the voters to the ballot boxes, that voter apathy in this country persists. Because I told you initially this law was drafted by Hezbollah and by the Aounis, by the, the president camp. And this law was made to completely annihilate the anti-corruption, the young civil society. A very few ones made it. But when you see that we have less than 50 percent participation in the vote casting, you can say that the Lebanese voted in a referendum not only against their government and the regime, they voted against the whole law that was imposed to them and that they did not understand. It's a very complicated law and they did not accept. I want to talk about that new law. It was introduced last summer and uh, there were a lot of complications surrounding this law. I have been in Lebanon over the past few days and voters have been saying to me that actually we're a little bit confused. We're seeing some lists of candidates. We're seeing some individual candidates. They're not always in allegiance with each other. We're seeing some temporary alliances. Confusion reigns. Total confusion. You see enemies who are in the same list, friends who have been completely separated by the law. And in fact, this is a law that was not understood by the population. And it took long minutes for any voter to go inside and cast a ballot. It is the most unbelievable law ever imagined. And I think that the whole, any, any way I voted, I was a member of parliament, I voted against this law. And I knew that the result of this law would be complete confusion in the next uh, House of Parliament. And you will see complications starting the 20th of May. Another question for you. I want to go back to that topic that we were addressing earlier. Of course, uh, Saad Hariri, Lebanon, has asked for the support of the European Union, the United States, to be able to rebuild its infrastructure. But this all comes at a time when it is stuck in this proxy war between Iran and Saudi Arabia. What do you expect to come out of this? Saad is uh, the son of one of my best friends that we lost in 2005, Rafiq Hariri. And I wish him good luck in trying to implement with such a parliament resulting from such a law to try to obtain the credits, to obtain the policy of dissociation that he wants to advocate between Iran and Saudi Arabia in order not to alienate the Gulf against us and not to have the repercussions of Iranian aggressivity against us. I think it's going to be a very hard task for Saad Hariri, very hard task in forming government, in having a coherent government, homogeneous government, and keeping the country uh, away from bankruptcy from one side or a regional war on the other hand. Minister Hamadeh, for more on that, we're actually going to cross to our correspondent in Tehran, Reza Sayya, who's been following developments for us from the Iranian capital. Reza, can you tell us what kind of reactions you're hearing from Tehran today? Yeah, obviously, Tehran keeping a close eye on these uh, elections. Some in the Iranian media uh, gloated uh, over the results of these elections. One news organization uh, saying that the outcome of this uh, election is an end to the uh, monopoly Prime Minister Hariri had over Sunni politicians. However, uh, the response from the Iranian leadership has been muted, uh, low-key. It came in the form of a statement uh, by the spokesperson for the foreign ministry saying that he respected uh, the election results, uh, saying that Lebanon uh, was an independent country and that Iran is ready to work with the government 
uh, voted in by the majority uh, of uh, Lebanese. And, and it's no surprise uh, that the Iranian leadership has a uh, low-key, somewhat muted uh, response to these elections. First off, Iran understands that the outcome of these elections are, are not a game-changer. Uh, obviously, uh, Hezbollah did not win the two-third majority required to make uh, drastic changes in Lebanese politics, for example, changing the constitution. Uh, Iran understands that. Uh, Iran is also uh, very sensitive uh, about the perception that it meddles in elections uh, in the region. Uh, so that's another reason uh, why it wants to downplay the, these uh, election results. However, you can be sure that behind closed doors, the Iranian leadership is very pleased at the outcome of these elections, Senator. Marza Saya reporting for us uh, from Tehran, and I'd like to thank our guests who joined us today, Marwan Hamad, Lebanon's Minister of Education and uh, Journalist. Thank you very much for joining us, sir. Now, with that historic vote uh, out of the way, the Prime Minister, the Sunni Prime Minister of Lebanon, has uh, called for a new government to be formed very swiftly so that uh, they can get on with their jobs, so that they can get on with reforms and uh, put the country's finances back on track. But many challenges lie ahead. Among them, the country's uh, fraying infrastructure. We're talking about something that sounds very simple to you and I, perhaps, and that's getting the rubbish off the streets, the economic problems that persist. Now, our uh, reporter in London, Nick Rushworth, takes a look at the tasks that lie ahead for those lawmakers. This was the first vote in almost a decade. However, Lebanese leaders expressed dismay at the low turnout. Among the challenges then for newly elected MPs, building trust in the political system amid significant cynicism and skepticism. Nothing will change. I'm actually hoping it will stay the same, but I fear it will only get worse. It is the same type of people, but with different names. If one member of the political elite is not running, then it is his son or grandson or his brother. While the new parliament is tarred with the same accusations of corruption, the hands-on task will be getting a new government in place. That's seen as vital in reassuring investors of Lebanon's economic stability. Rebooting the economy means taking on one of the world's highest debt-to-GDP ratios of more than 150 percent. One sign of the scale of the crisis facing MPs is that there was no budget for 12 years. A donor conference held in Paris in April raised more than $11 billion in soft loans, money that Lebanese people will want to see used to build infrastructure, guarantee the electricity supply and help with the waste crisis which continues despite the riots of a couple of years ago. Other challenges include security, the country borders Syria and Israel, the emergence of a stronger Hezbollah could fray nerves in the region and with Washington. And there is also an ongoing refugee crisis with around one and a half million Syrians now in Lebanon. That's 25% of the population. Some Lebanese politicians have called for them to return. Now, uh, joining me now is uh, on the debate is Hadi Daimian. He's a lecturer at St. Joseph University. He's also the founder of Gay Pride here in Lebanon. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much. Now, some observers are saying that the glass ceiling here in Lebanon could have been somewhat broken because maybe one or two candidates managed to get through who were independent. We know for sure that Polaya Oubion from the civil society independent lady got to parliament and uh, she got to parliament after quite a fierce campaign that she led and um, she represented in this campaign quite a lot because first a lot of people were definitely attacking her just because she because she used to work at Future TV that is considered to be a television associated with the, that is a television associated with the Prime Minister or the party of the Prime Minister. And the biggest question was how could somebody who was so close from this political party could now become independent and have this different alternative discourse? And the second thing, she was attacked on the base that she is a woman and they were attacking her throwing 
uh, quite a lot of... You're talking about all her challenges, but she's in. Oh, she's definitely in. Of course she's in. Actually, um, she might be the only one from the civil society to be in parliament. Now, I want to talk about the civil society movement. They seem to be riding this wave of discontent here in Lebanon about the economic issues. We've been talking about this throughout the program, the rubbish crisis, the refugee crisis uh, that has seeped over from the war in Syria. Do you think with this one or potentially two independent candidates that get in, they can actually make a difference or was it just for optics? You know, in the history of Lebanon, we had parliamentary blocs made of two, four, or even seven people who were capable to change a certain status quo just by working. It's not a matter of, uh, of number as much as it's a number of, uh, of parliamentarians, as much as it is um, the strength of the reflection and the thinking that is put into what we want to do, actually. Uh, yes, they are riding a wave of discontent, and it's a very legitimate wave. And... Um, and the civil... Uh... So you're saying that just the very fact that even if one or two of them get in, that already sends the message that for future elections perhaps some level of change is possible? Even before the, 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 the next uh, parliamentary election, because now they have four years in parliament, or at least Paula has four years in parliament, whereby she can do a lot of things just by being an MP part of the opposition is already something. Plus, she will be definitely on many files joining forces with other MPs. And at the end of the day, she has the title of MP. So uh, she definitely has a voice that uh, goes even beyond what it used to go before. And it's very important that we capitalize on this. It's interesting that you say that. I want to talk a little bit about the actual election campaign. There were some confusions. We've been speaking about this on the debate today. It appears as though some of these so-called independent candidates, what's being referred to as external players, actually had to align themselves with the more traditional political players in this country that have been at the helm for decades and decades just to emerge stronger. Doesn't that sound disappointing to you? I can't answer this because I do not have all the elements of language. However, we know that when you want to make a change, you have two ways of making a change. You either go on the street and you throw stones, or you can simply perform consent with the given status quo. So the moment you are inside, the moment you have infiltrated what you wanted to infiltrate, you can really be independent and you can voice your own opinion. You know, there is nothing called independence because at the end of the day, there is nothing called independent uh, candidates because at the end of the day, it's all a matter of political choice and a political positioning, where I stand in regard to this file or to this other thing. So. Uh, this is it. Now are we disappointed that some people wanted to align themselves on another discourse? Well, we already had people running in the civil society lists who used to be big uh, players in political parties in Lebanon. Uh, and uh, this is also something that weakened uh, perhaps some of the lists of the civil society. Hadi, with your own uh, movement or, or event, Gay Pride, I, I'll, I'll come back to that, of course. You yourself are at the helm of this campaign to try and push against these uh, traditional norms in the country. Do you think that even if this possibility of change was offered here by these uh, independent candidates, there's at any point uh, for the Lebanese political system, for people to actually be able to believe in change and to reduce this voter apathy because numbers were extremely low given that it's been almost a decade since they had an election, given that there were these women candidates, given that there were all these first-time voters, over half a million of them. What happened? You phrased it well earlier when you said that the civil um, campaign was riding a wave of discontent. And also people are totally aware of the presence of clientelism in Lebanon. And yes, there is a kind of fatalism, uh, a lot of ism words, um, uh, telling you that, you know, when you want to get to a hospital, if we do not, if you are not properly connected to a specific leader, to a, spe a specific uh, uh, highly ranked person, you will not get access to this uh, given uh, hospital or whatever. So the situation goes way beyond uh, what we are, what, were, what was also discussed in the election, the, the campaigns, because we have to understand that we do not live in a bubble. Earlier you were referring to the, to, to, to the gay movement in Lebanon. You know, you, we cannot just speak about 
people being gay. You cannot speak about sexuality without taking into consideration uh, economic matters, without taking into consideration health matters, and so on. Uh, we are at the intersection of everything especially when you want to do politics. And it's very important that we be aware of this element. Um, it, there is hope, of course there is hope. And I think especially for someone like you who managed to push this move through, Gay Pride Lebanon, first time 2017, that itself is progress. Very briefly. Very briefly, Beirut Pride rides on a wave, on a momentum, of course, obviously. Uh, now, to speak of a progress, we are not to forget that years and years ago, the Middle East used to be very, very, very much progressive when it comes to same-sex intercourse, while the West used to be definitely not progressive. So today, we cannot look at the, at the West as being the, the, defender, of the defender of the, of the LGBT rights uh, in, in, in particular. So yes, hope is very important. Hope is inevitable. Hope is not even evolution. Hope is life. On that hopeful note, uh, Hadi, Damien, thank you very much for speaking to us. Of course, you're the founder of Gay Pride here in Lebanon. I appreciate that. Now, as uh, we've been speaking here on the debate special from Lebanon, one of the most immediate concerns for the majority of the voters here in Lebanon was the cost of living. And the country's faced extremely slow economic growth as a result of the neighboring war in Syria, which has had a great impact on everything from tourism to infrastructure to finance to, of course, the state of the country's housing. Now, additionally, according to the World Bank, uh, more than half of the population actually earns uh, under 750 US dollars per month. The Ministry of Labor itself has said that a resident can no longer sustain or manage to survive on their weekly or monthly wage. Now, here's a report from our correspondent here on the ground, Leila Molana Allen. Here in the suburbs of Beirut, a daily battle to pay the bills. Lebanon's minimum wage is $450 a month. But while wages have stayed static since 2012, basic household commodities have risen by 40%. As a result, personal debt is skyrocketing. Cedric Mansour, a nurse at a local hospital, earns $600 a month. He feels lucky to have work, but still can't make ends meet. Things are getting worse. I already have $26,000 of debt with the bank as well as rent to pay. You can't survive without working a second, third and fourth job to support your family. The poorest 12% of households qualify for government support, but far fewer actually receive it. And programs like these are no help to families like the Mansours, who hover just above the poverty line and are forced to survive on credit. I tried to contact many ministries for help, but they all hung up the phone on me. Cedric's wife Eliane fears for her young children. Children have needs. If I take them out and they want something to eat from the supermarket, I don't have the money to buy it. My husband and I can live off anything, but that's not the case for children. Whoever is voted in, the family has little hope that these elections will solve things. People are really suffering and terribly poor, but they just care about elections, winning seats and money. Others in the community agree. Most poor Lebanese have lost faith in a political elite they see as lining their own pockets at the expense of the working classes. They need to look after the poor who don't have anything to eat and have no work. They deserve better than this. They won't do anything. I was born like this and I'll die like this. The government's official unemployment rate is 10%, but an independent 2017 report put it closer to 25%. And with 30,000 young Lebanese expected to enter the workforce this year, competing for only 7,000 new jobs, it's difficult to see how the country's newly elected government will make up the shortfall. Okay. Now, a record number of women ran in this parliamentary election, 86 candidates. Uh, only one of them managed to gain a seat. Uh, and uh, actually, she joins us now, Paula Jakobjunsch, is a prominent journalist. Uh, thank you very much for joining us here on The Debate. Thank you. I'm not the only woman, however. We are six or seven women. But still, this is 
the lowest uh, uh, in the whole region, the lowest in the world, maybe. And that this is what I want to talk about, yeah. because women are still largely underrepresented here in Lebanon specifically, and it's even less than what we previously had. 2009, four women candidates. Exactly. And uh, we had 111 candidates at, at the beginning. However, they did not take these candidates on their list. Most lists were... Uh, had only maybe one or two women running and they were in seats that they knew already that they cannot win. So they did not let them compete to the fullest. I don't think they gave a fair uh, chance to, to women. They promised us first the quota and then there was no quota. And after that, they promised... Because Hezbollah walked out of parliament at a time when all this was being discussed. Well, the problem is not only Hezbollah, even Christian parties. Let me tell you, the, the party of the president, the current president, uh, had a list in Ashrafiyya, in my region, without uh, one woman. It was eight men on a list, and not even one woman was represented. Even to fail, they did not give her the chance. So I asked people to boycott this list, and I hope men and women did boycott this list. They managed to get um, four MPs. I think it's three, because I think we have two. Uh, and you can see her name here in the paper, Jumana Haddad. They said that she won, and today we woke up. The official result, they're saying that she didn't make it. And we have and of course, people have been taking to the streets, they've been protesting this, they're crying foul as we speak. We were, we were there uh, the whole afternoon. We were a lot of people, especially that you have to know that most Lebanese people, they don't take the streets anymore. They're so desperate, they don't believe in anything. So the, numbers, the number of people who came, who showed up, was really, really impressive for me. Uh, and, uh, and then... Um, nothing happened after that. Until now, we don't know what they will do. But let me tell you one thing. We knew that she won, not from our electoral machine. It was our opponent who said that she won in their numbers and in their calculations. And at 10 o'clock yesterday night, they almost disappeared from Ashrafiyya. They just shut down their machines and left. And we were asking some friends of ours, you know, it's, it's a small community. We were asking them, what, what happened to your numbers? And I got two of them telling me that they crashed. One told me that they had a problem. It was, sorry, it was very, very weird. And uh, so we woke up today. We didn't sleep, actually. But we were, what we know today that she's, she's not in. Well, I want to... I want to speak a little bit about your own campaigning. You have presented yourself as a so-called independent candidate, of course, uh, part of this, with the civil society movement. There's a big question that I saw that there has been some criticism towards you in Lebanese media because, of course, you're a journalist for Future TV, very much aligned with the Prime Minister Saad Hariri. And all the women that we've had in Parliament up until this point, the four women, are also part of this political dynasty. They're wives, they're sisters of current politicians. What is this? I was I wasn't an objective journalist because in Lebanon you cannot be objective. I don't cover the story. I live the consequences. So when I was on Future TV, I used to say my mind most of the time, and most of the time it was against the future movement. And they used to complain against me to President Hariri, and he used to tell them, "It's okay. The press should be free." <laughs> this is something that uh, that's really positive in him. However. I left because I have no faith anymore that they will do any change, that we can see a new dawn in this country. Things are going from worse to worse. And uh, as you all know, we don't have electricity in 2018. The pollution is unheard of. And, and we're not China. I mean, it, this is Lebanon where we don't have real industry. We cannot go to the sea. We used to have one of the most beautiful shores. Now it's all garbage. I was really fed up, and I, I come from a region where they put the, the, the dump, the worst dump ever in Bush Hamoud, with no criteria, and it, I, I went mad, and I was like, I have to do something. Is there a movement for the brave in this country, or we are all desperate, and, we, and it's entrenched in our psyche that you can change anything. And then I started talking to the civil society movement. They came to me and they told me, even you're on Future TV, we hear you talk about things that are our concern. You, we look alike. And uh, this is how we started. We talked for months and months. And then I decided to 
To join, to join the movement of the brave, I wish I did it long time before, because I think we are on the right track, and someone should talk to people, should to communicate with them, to tell them this fear-mongering campaign should stop in Lebanon. What we live in Lebanon is fear-mongering. They're just telling people that they're too different because they come from different, uh, they have different religious identities. Well, I do want to talk about your campaign a little bit. As you mentioned, you very much honed in on the daily issues that the Lebanese are speaking, the rubbish problem, the pollution, the economic issues. I didn't feel, observing the elections, I've been looking at them for the past uh, few weeks, certainly the campaigning, there wasn't really a massively feminist agenda. There isn't. There isn't. Because Lebanon, the only um, thing, the only tool they have, they just tell people that they just use fear mongering. That's it. Nothing else. The country is a big failure. And all they do is tell people that, you know, you're a Christian minority, you have to be afraid, so you have to elect us because we protect you. I don't know how they're protecting any rights. We have no rights as citizens, as citizens. And this is something in common for all Lebanese. So we are urging the people of Lebanon to be united, to be really, uh, because we, have, we share the same problems and we, we, we share the same country, same aspirations. I started my, my campaign with a slogan, enough. And this is, I think it was, uh, this is what people are saying and thinking. Enough. You're saying enough, but I have one last question for you before we move on to the next uh, segment. You failed very famously whilst uh, being a uh, journalist, of course, interviewed Saad Hariri uh, when he had his surprise resignation, went to Riyadh. What kind of hopes do you have for a country that's very much caught in this battleground between Saudi Arabia and Iran, briefly? Well, this is also the same thing. Once we think as one people, united, we do our own national interest. For now, we don't do this. We do whatever they want. We, we either back Iran in their agenda or sometimes back Saudi in, in their agenda. And this is one of the biggest problems that we face in Lebanon, not from now, from maybe 400 years till now. We are run, a country run by ambassadors. Ambassadors should go back to do their jobs, and we have to do our, our job, and we have to elect people who don't have this alienation, ideological or financial or any kind of alienation with external powers, because they're not charities. When they help by giving arms or giving money or any kind of help, they just want something in return, and usually... It's not for the good of, of the Lebanese people. It's a country that uh, has a system that's decrepit within and, of course, influenced from external forces. Paula Yakubian, a winner, a woman candidate in Lebanon's elections. Congratulations. Thank you very much for joining Thank us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now, as uh, Paula and I have been speaking and as I've been mentioning throughout the entire program, Lebanon has become yet another arena for the struggle between regional rivals, Iran and Saudi Arabia. And it's been dragged into the war next door. We're, of course, talking about the war in Syria, which has sent over a million refugees uh, into the country, all of which has brought instability. Here's a report from Emerald Maxwell. With its stated policy of neutrality and historic ties to France, Lebanon has the potential to be a bridge between the West and the Middle East. France has long provided support and last November, Emmanuel Macron played an important role as mediator when Lebanese Prime Minister Saad Hariri temporarily resigned from office, allegedly coerced by historical backer Saudi Arabia. I invited him to France for a few days with his family. It's a gesture of friendship and of France's willingness to contribute to the return of calm in Lebanon. That crisis laid bare the regional rivalry that had long been playing out in Lebanon between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Riyadh has close ties with the Lebanese Sunnis and has attempted to use the country's fragile political balance as a path to curbing Iran's influence in the region. But with Saudi Arabia distracted by its proxy war with Tehran in Yemen, Iran has been cementing its influence in Lebanon by backing Hezbollah. The Shiite group has become the biggest armed force in Lebanon, enjoying some support for its offensives against Israel in 2000 and 2006. But it's also been criticized for its key military support of the Syrian regime, which goes against Lebanon's policy to stay out of its neighbor's conflict. Meanwhile, an estimated 1.5 million Syrians have fled to Lebanon, 
It hosts the highest number of refugees per capita in the world. As their continued presence fuels tensions in the country, Beirut has stepped up calls to the international community to share the load and help facilitate their return. For more on that, uh, I'm joined here in the Lebanese capital by Tony Nisi, who's a political analyst. Thank you very much for joining us. Now, many observers of these elections are saying that this wasn't just a local parliamentary elections. There were a lot of external forces at uh, play, including Iran and Saudi Arabia. I guess so, yes, you know, because Lebanon is uh, like a stronghold for everybody in the region, especially for Saudi Arabia and Iran. But uh, what's really happening here is that this election law is tailored in a way that Hezbollah is getting the country again. So even that Saudi Arabia, maybe they have some uh, money influence, I don't know. I haven't seen them here, but everybody is saying this. But the influence of the weapons of Hezbollah is more and more influential, more than that. And also the electoral law is made in a, in a way that Hezbollah is getting the country. He won the elections and he has all of his allies everywhere in Lebanon right now. And of course, what we're also seeing here is uh, a somehow seeping through of the Lebanon, the even Syrian conflict next door. As a result of that, the refugees are coming over. There's an immense ongoing security crisis. And that's been at the helm. That's been the reason why the Lebanese authorities are saying we've been at a political deadlock. We haven't had an election in nine years. How do they propose to overcome this? Do you believe this? I believe the elections is not happening for a political reason, Lebanese political reasons. Because right now, the crisis of the refugees is more than ever. And you know how much we have terrorist groups inside the Palestinian camps? Do you know how many Palestinian refugees we have here in Lebanon? I guess they delayed the elections in a way just to reach, and they, they did not do any electoral law until last year, because they were, they were doing the electoral law in a way to to hold all the country. If we did the elections four years ago on the last law that it's called the law of 1960, I think the the shape of the parliament is going to be different than now. This is the best timing for Hezbollah. This is the best timing uh, and the best law they could have ever get. And I guess right now by controlling Lebanon, they will tell everybody, especially the West, look, we have here like uh, a kidnapped country. You know, and this country is in our hand. We're going to bargain on the head of this country in Syria and everywhere else. And so that's a question. That's very interesting that you just mentioned that because, of course, with Hezbollah winning, that means that uh, the alliance of Saad Hariri, the Sunni prime minister, has made has had to, suffered some losses uh, in the country's uh, elections. Now, of course, we had Hariri not long ago lobby for finances from the European Union, from the United States, to invest it into the infrastructure of the country. Could we say that his, somehow his position has been weakened by this uh, parliamentary election in the eyes of the international community? Yes, of course, but listen to this. The whole world wants Lebanon to be stabilized, especially because we have this much of refugees in here. They don't want them to go anywhere. So I guess the international community, they are ready to pay like $11 billion, even if they know that Hezbollah is controlling the country and everything else. They want Lebanon to, to stay as it is, just because they want the refugees to stay here. So we don't want any problem with Lebanon. So you're saying the reason that they're trying to keep instability in Lebanon is just so that this can be the only country that essentially shoulders the burden of the refugee crisis? It's one of the countries. It's one of the countries. But you know what? I'm going to tell you this. Now there's a huge war happening inside Syria. And Israel is on the border of Lebanon. I don't think it's on behalf of everybody to have a destabilized Lebanon. The economical situation in Lebanon is very critical, and it's very hard to everybody. So, they have one of two choices. Lebanon is crashing economically, it's crashing as security matters. We have refugees more than we can handle. We have terrorist groups more than we can handle. The only thing right now that the international community can do is pumping money inside Lebanon. Give, them, give us the money under the slogan of, you know what, uh, I don't know what, reform and something like this. But the main reason is going to be just putting Lebanon in a situation that can survive for a while. Because the solutions is not coming yet. So the solution is, is going to be coming maybe in a few years. From now till then, maybe we're going to be a part of the war of what's happening in Syria, but they don't want Lebanon to be destabilized soon. That's it.
Kodinisi, I've got one last question for you. Earlier today we had one of the first international reactions coming from none other than Israel, saying that at the time being, for the time being, Lebanon equals Hezbollah. Do they really have reason to be feared? Because, of course, Hezbollah essentially means Iran, and Iran is their biggest regional rival. No, I will tell you this. Israel, they prefer the Israel, they prefer Lebanon to be Hezbollah. I'm going to give you an example. In 2006, the international community, they used to have something called 14th of March allies in Lebanon. So they forbid Israel from attacking the institutions. So the world was was between Hezbollah and Israel. It wasn't between Lebanon and Israel. And you know, whenever, whenever there's a country like Israel, if they are not allowed to attack the infrastructure of Lebanon, this means they will never win the war. So for Israel, a country like Israel, for them, it's it's a must to have Lebanon in the hands of Hezbollah to be able to attack freely. Your theories are also fascinating. The, the world wants to keep Lebanon destabilize. Israel wants Lebanon to remain in the hands of Hezbollah. I've never heard these theories before. I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to tell you why. Listen, look, look at the picture in Lebanon. In Lebanon now, during these elections, every Hezbollah ally is in the parliament. We have maybe 15 uh, members of parliament with Lebanese forces, two or three with Kataib. These are the only remaining three, maybe few with the Waligian blood. But our experience is telling us that Waligian blood and Saad al-Hariri are compromising with Hezbollah. Now, we're going to face a new political era in Lebanon. If the Lebanese forces, they will join the government, they will say, OK, for the stabilization of Lebanon, we're going to be a part of the system. Everybody will say everybody is in bed with Hezbollah in Lebanon. Because if, if we did a joint government between the Lebanese forces, which is the free, only free party like the Kataib and somebody else, and the and Jumlat and Hariri and Hezbollah and the Aounist, it means everybody is in bed with Hezbollah. And it's, it's not going to be a healthy situation for the Lebanese. If this happens, you're going to find a stabilized Lebanon for a while. Everybody will be happy inside. The money will come, you know, but at the same time, everybody will be happy. At the D time, when Israel wants to attack for a reason, or when Hezbollah is going to attack Israel for a reason, they will have a free land for them with no allies. And this is very bad for Lebanon. This is the most dangerous situation uh, in Lebanon after this election. We want to have a real opposition in Lebanon, otherwise we're going to lose the country. On that note, uh, Tony, we're just going to uh, stay with us. We're going to cross over to Jerusalem where our correspondent, uh, Iris Makler, is uh, standing by. Iris, can you tell us what reactions you're hearing on the ground there to the results uh, coming out of uh, Lebanon today? Interestingly, other than what you said earlier, Lebanon now equals Hezbollah. There has not been an official reaction that I have heard yet. But um, I don't agree with your last guest. This isn't good news for, uh, for Israel at all because it puts in a, a much strengthened enemy. Uh, it puts their enemy in a much strengthened position, let me put it like that. And if you look geopolitically, if you look in a larger sense, I have, for example, I have read one analyst inside Lebanon saying that the reason that Hezbollah uh, is in a strengthened position is because of its anti-Israel stance. So that doesn't um, go down well here in Jerusalem. And if you look regionally, uh, Hezbollah, the ally of Iran, Israel's greatest neighbor, uh, enemy in the region, is, you know, is the winner. And Saudi Arabia, Israel's new frenemy, possibly becoming a friend, is the loser. So on, for both those reasons, I think Israel is not going to be happy with this result. Eris Makler reporting uh, for us uh, from Jerusalem. Tony Nisi, I'll come back to you with one last question. We heard from Iris there that she doesn't necessarily agree with your theory, but she does believe that as a result of this win, we will see more of an allegiance between uh, Israel and uh, Saudi Arabia. Do you think so? Maybe. <laughs> you know what? Let me tell you. Everybody now is saying that a deal is cutting between Saudi Arabia and Israel. And what's happening in Lima right now will put them together more and more closer than ever, without saying that they are negotiating, because we don't know. I believe that the head of Hezbollah is a real uh, question, or let's say it's a demand from Saudi Arabia to the West, especially to the United States. Who is going to pay the price? I guess the Saudi Arabia. Who is going to do the job? This is what everybody is saying. Everybody is saying Israel is going to do the job when the time will come. We don't know if this is true or untrue, but it's everywhere. 
this is everywhere among the analysts more than in the newspapers you know so uh, what what i heard is yes maybe uh, as long as hezbollah is controlling lebanon Israel is going to be more serious to talk to Saudi Arabia, and Saudi Arabia is going to be more serious talking to Israel. But I know for a fact that Saudi Arabia, you said it, they are trying to inspire the elections in Lebanon. They are supporting Saad al-Hariri, they are supporting Samir Jaja, they are supporting the so-called reformists in Lebanon. It's a matter of, if Saad al-Hariri, he wants to compromise with Hezbollah, if Saad al-Hariri compromise with Hezbollah and Samir Jaja enter the government with Hezbollah, this will lead Saudi Arabia to leave Lebanon. And at that time, Saudi Arabia will pay the price to, on the head of Hezbollah. But if we can, and it's an only if, have a new opposition in Lebanon made out of Hariri as himself, uh, Lebanese forces, Jumblat, and somebody else to get at least the third of the parliament, I think we're going to have more and more time, and I think the war is going to be longer and maybe far away from now. But if Hezbollah is uh, going to control all the country in a, in a compromised government, it's true. And uh, to the sound of Azan, we come to the end of the show. Tony Nisi, thank you very much for joining us here on the debate on thank France. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank you for watching this edition of the debate on France 24, live from Lebanon. Do stay tuned.